Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Gist Cancer UK's first virtual patient and carer meeting. Um, it's a nice sunny day where I'm living, so I hope you're all enjoying this, this nice weather as well. Uh, my name is Nick Puntis. I'm chair of Gist Support, Gist Cancer UK, sorry. Um, and I'm very pleased to be chairing this meeting for you all. Uh, we have uh, a number of people speaking for us today, uh, and that includes uh, uh, somebody from uh, all parts of the country, uh, London, up north, and down in... Uh, uh, sorry, bear with me a second. Let's try to get rid of that. Yeah, so um, so we've got some very interesting speakers and uh, hopefully it'll be a very informative uh, meeting for you. Um, so if I could ask you all, first of all, if you could turn your cameras off and mute yourselves as well, please. We will be asking you in between question and answer sessions, everybody to put their cameras back on again and smile because we'd like to take some pictures if that's okay. So what I would say is if you don't want your picture taken, don't, don't put your camera on. Um, so today's agenda is uh, quarter past two, we'll be having a talk by uh, Dr. Iona Nixon and Professor Robin Jones. Iona is a consultant clinical oncologist from the Beetson West Scotland Cancer Centre. And Robin is uh, Professor Robin Jones from uh, the Royal Marsden. He's a consultant medical oncologist. Uh, following their, their talk, we'll be having a question and answer session uh, where you can ask, I'll talk to you about how to pose your any questions you might have in a moment, but you can ask some questions of the of the two speakers. We'll then have that photograph that I was just talking to you about, um, uh, after which we've got a talk from uh, Vicky Rockingham, uh, MBE, who is a wild type GIST patient, mother, and she currently works for the Environment Agency. Um, and Wendy Unsworth, who's a medical advisor at the Aintree Information Centre, and they'll be talking about continuing to work when diagnosed with a GIST. Uh, again, following them, we'll have a question and answer session uh, with them. And then finally, we'll be having Jane Bressington, my, our vice chair, who'll be giving you an update on where we are with cancer, uh, GIST Cancer UK at the moment. Um, and we haven't actually been able to speak to to many of you over this pandemic period, but hopefully that might all change fairly soon. Things are looking up with regard to vaccinations. So we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to have a, a normal meeting face-to-face -face at some stage. Uh, so a little bit of uh, meeting etiquette. Um, as I said, if you could keep your cameras and microphones muted, uh, unless during the question and answer session, uh, we invite you to ask a question. Um, I would ask you to post your questions via the chat box um, throughout the presentations. You can ask you can ask a question, and then, as I say, in the fifteen minute question and answer session, we'll we'll either be taking the questions that have been asked or invite for people to ask the questions themselves. You can also raise a hand. Um, when we've only got fifteen minutes per question session, so. Uh, Putting your question through the chat box is best, but uh, if you're if you'd like to speak, it's not a problem. Raise a hand, and hopefully we'll get to you. If you have any technical issues, please send an email to gcuk at productionbureau.com, and we'll get back to you uh, with hopefully a resolution to any of the technical issues that that you may have. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to do before we hand over to the speakers is uh, thank some pharmaceutical companies for their financial support in helping us run these meetings. And they are Bayer, Desafira and Blueprint, all of which have very generously helped us to fund the cost of doing this because we are a voluntary run organization. And also I'd like to thank Jane Bressington, vice chair for sorting this meeting out along with Anna May and her team from Production Bureau who uh, I'm thanking her now because I'm sure this will go as smoothly as we expect it to. Um, but again, we'll, we'll thank at the end as well. And just for your information, we have almost 100 people participating at the moment in this meeting. Hopefully we'll have a few more people join us as, uh, as we continue. 
Um, so now I'd like to hand over to uh, Iona Nixon, Do Dr. Iona Nixon to start with, and then uh, Professor Robin Jones, and they are going to be talking about addressing the needs of cancer patients in the pandemic lockdown. Thank you, Iona. Hello, everyone. It is a great pleasure and honor to be invited to talk about the special needs of sarcoma and GIST patients in the pandemic and lockdown. This talk is a joint talk with my dear colleague and friend, Professor Robin Jones. There is a quote from Hippocrates that says, where there is a love of medicine, there is a love of humanity. My name is Ioana Nixon. I am a sarcoma oncologist in Glasgow, and I'm also Greek. Therefore, I feel I have a close affinity with Hippocrates. This quote is now more relevant than ever as humanity is challenged with the pandemic and each and every one of us plays a role to help us get through this challenging time. Today, we will discuss the current healthcare landscape, focusing on the care for sarcoma and GIST patients and what we, as oncology community, have done to respond to the pandemic. What are the efforts of the oncology community in terms of forming guidelines for cancer care during the pandemic? To this direction, we will talk you through the current guidelines. We will share with you our data to show some figures in relation to the impact of COVID on sarcoma and guest care. We will also discuss telemedicine and what we discovered regarding patient experience through telemedicine on the basis of research we did. Finally, in this talk, we will also give some information on clinical trials for GIST patients, as well as on COVID vaccination for patients, both topics of interest to the majority of our patients. To set the scenes, I will start by the first and most important thing, which is listening to the patients. Not only with a stethoscope in the context of a clinical examination, but truly listening to understand, which will then enable us the medical team to help the individual the best way possible and personalize their care. A few years ago, in 2018, the Scottish Sarcoma Network organized a day for patients and carers on resilience. The event had some lectures and also some facilitated discussions led by our psychologists on patient needs and an experience. What we as medical teams discovered about our patient and carers' needs are summarized here. I'm sharing this with you as the baseline for our discussion on the special needs of patients under the current climate. Our patients said they need clear and honest communication. They need compassion. They need peer support. They need better communication and more support from their GP. They need a key worker, a named clinical nurse specialist to support them through the cancer journey. They need access to information and best treatments for their disease, tailored to their needs as individuals. They need to be seen as people, not as a disease. They also said at the end of the event, they no longer feel alone. They feel that there are other people on the same journey. So bringing everyone nicely to, to the present, during the pandemic, here are some patient stories that actually highlight needs that COVID made more evident. Anya is 46 years old. She has a soft tissue sarcoma and treatment plan involves preoperative radiotherapy followed by surgery. She comes from Perth, which is considerable distance from Glasgow, therefore needs to be an inpatient with us for five weeks, which is the duration of her radiotherapy treatment. Although she can still contact her family and see her child through video calls, she admits she struggles without physical contact with them. At the same time, her family also struggles and feels they can't support her the most during this challenging time as they report to medical team when they contact us for regular updates. Heather is 28. She's a mom of a three-year-old daughter 
and is newly diagnosed with an osteosarcoma. She is undergoing intensive chemotherapy and needs to spend considerable time in the hospital with us without any visitors. Her husband is in contact with her through video calls. However, she struggles not being able to see him and her little girl. And here you see her What Matters to Me chart saying that her wish is to get well and go home to her little girl. So what do these stories tell us? Let's hold on to that question. We all know sarcomas and kisses are rare tumours. And they ought to be treated by teams with expertise. They ought to be treated in specialised centres. They ought to be managed in a clinical network which works in partnership with wider networks, clinical and non-clinical. And they also ought to be diagnosed promptly. The needs of sarcoma and GIST patients during the pandemic and lockdown have become, unsurprisingly, more complex. This is due to the number of changes that the pandemic forced upon us and upon cancer services. How did we as a community respond to the changes and what did we do to understand your needs? Over to my colleague, Professor Robin Jones, who will briefly discuss some of the guidelines we rapidly produced to ensure safe delivery of care for our patients. So, um, thanks very much. And um, again, I'm uh, very grateful for the um, invitation and uh, grateful uh, to um, Dr. Nixon for the kind words. So as mentioned, um, with the advent of the pandemic, we developed a set of recommendations for uh, GIST and sarcoma patients in the um, COVID era. And these basically prioritized um, the um, outpatient treatment for um, people um, based on the um, grade and the aggressiveness of their um, uh, cancer. And these slides uh, just briefly um, outlined the um, priority levels for uh, various different um, treatments. Uh, this slide highlighting that patients undergoing pre or post-operative uh, chemotherapy for um, uh, diseases such as osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcomas should have high priority as um, uh, is the case for patients with um, preoperative or um, post-operative imatinib for um, high-risk localised GIST. And um, in the context of the uh, pandemic, uh, this uh, prioritisation uh, system worked um, really uh, well for our institution and uh, other teams in the United Kingdom and um, across um, Europe. So next slide, please. And you can see uh, that um, as part of our um, ESMO um, guidance with specific reference to um, uh, GISTs that the initiation of imatinib, sunitinib and rigorafenib as first, second and third line respectively for uh, GIST patients was uh, given um, high priority. Also uh, continuation of treatment in the context of a clinical trial um, provided that the benefits outweighed the risk of um, treatment. Um, and of course, in the context of a lockdown and the uh, general pandemic with possible adaptation of procedures without affecting patients safety and study conduct. And in a way, this reflects the, um, the uh, fact that um, um, we um, tried to prioritise as best we could in, in very difficult circumstances and change appointments where possible, including for um, clinical trials to um, telemedicine uh, appointments. In the um, general context of patients with other types of sarcomas, um, high to medium priority was given to uh, first line or further lines of treatment for um, advanced disease. But again, the chemotherapy um, agents that we use uh, for most um, uh, sarcomas are far more toxic than um, some of the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we use for GIST. So next slide, please. Thank you, Robin, that was fantastic. And just to add that on behalf of the Scottish Sarcoma Network, we developed our guidelines which are in keeping with the guidelines shared by you. At this point, I would like to share with you more data from the Scottish Sarcoma Network. The government asked us to collect data on all cancers on treatment priorities and impact of COVID on decision-making. 
According to the data we have on sarcoma and guests from Scotland, we had 792 cases discussed through our oncology meeting between March 2020 and March 2021. Out of these, 280 are newly diagnosed sarcoma and guest patients and 512 are returned patients to the oncology meeting. There are four patients known to our oncology meeting. I need to uh, highlight at this point that the data you see, the figures you see, do not capture data from, uh, from the Edinburgh Oncology Meeting. In relation to COVID impact on treatment, overall this is recorded for seven cases. Three are newly diagnosed and the impact is change in treatment sequence and none of these patients are patients with GIST. Here you see a picture taken during the first lockdown. This is Glasgow Queen Street, uh, which is one of the busiest stations in Glasgow. I'm commuting to go to the Royal Infirmary Hospital to see a patient jointly with the orthopedic surgeons, and I'm literally the only person in the station, and very likely the only person on the train too. Moving on to telemedicine, an area emerging these days. One of the rapid changes the pandemic brought is the implementation of telemedicine as a measure to reduce hospital traffic and improve safety. Telemedicine is not something new. In fact, there has been an increasing interest in telemedicine since conception in 1967. Prof. Jones led on a study looking at telemedicine. So Robin, can you tell us a bit more about what you and your team have done and what you discovered? Thanks very much. So we performed uh, three uh, studies uh, initially at Royal Marsden um, uh, when we went into uh, lockdown. And the first um, tried to define the true impact of coronavirus disease in the at-risk population of patients with all types of cancer. Next slide, please. So the central assumption, the central basis of this study was that anti-cancer treatments might increase the severity of COVID-19. And um, Dr. Gennartis led um, this, to, uh, uh, th this particular study, looking at patients over the age of 18 years who had face-to-face -face appointments at the Royal Marsden uh, between March and April 2020, and then compared to the same period in 2019. And we also looked at patients that were treated with intravenous chemotherapy or oral anti-cancer therapy, which is very relevant, of course, for GIST. Looked at patients that were undergoing tests such as imaging and blood tests, patients undergoing surgery and radiation, and also all patients uh, that tested positive for COVID. Next slide, please. So um, in March and April 2020, uh, just under 13,500 uh, individual patients over uh, the age of 18 were seen at the Royal Marsden. Just over 2,000 of these received a cytotoxic chemotherapy, either intravenous or oral. Um, this, these treatments were administered alone or in combination with other treatments. And in total, sarcoma and GIST patients made, over, uh, made up 1,064 of these patients. Between March and April 2019, in the pre-COVID era, 18,087 patients were seen during the same um, time frame. Next slide, please. And this gives you, um, this table from the publication gives you a breakdown of the individual types of um, um, uh, uh, types of cancer that we um, studied. So as I said, this was a general um, study of all cancer patients um, treated at the Royal Marsden during that time period. And as you'd expect, um, the study included um, a variety of different um, solid tumors. Next slide, please. So in, in our study, 867 patients tested positive for COVID. 101 required uh, hospital admission. So out of the total of 13,489, this makes up 0.84%. So quite a low um, uh, percentage, which was very reassuring to us. And 
12 or 10.6 percent were admitted to the intensive care unit and sadly 29 um, people died but out of the total of three uh, 13,489 this was only 0.21 percent so quite quite a low number next slide please and uh, this slide, uh, again, from the publication, gives the treatment related characteristics of um, COVID-19 positive um, patients, um, with the majority undergoing um, palliative uh, treatments, so just under 65%, as opposed to 35% um, undergoing curative treatment. And as you'd expect for a broad range of um, types of cancer, a lot of different types of treatments are uh, administered. Next slide, please. So the conclusion from this study was that the overall incidence of clinically significant COVID-19 amongst patients with cancer attending the Royal Marsden Hospital in March, April 2020 was no higher than that in the general uh, population, which was a reassuring finding for us. Next slide, please. During this um, period, um, as I mentioned, um, of GIST and sarcoma patients, there were 1,064, and these were seen in um, all three um, uh, clinics, medical oncology, clinical oncology, as well as surgical oncology. Next slide, please. In terms of um, what we actually looked at, of, in terms of the outpatient appointments, um, we would see people face-to-face -face if they were starting treatment, if they had severe side effects uh, from treatment, and if um, they were um, having a discussion regarding stopping treatment, and that was approximately 20%. Everyone else we tried to transfer to telemedicine appointments. In terms of the um, oral drugs, either chemotherapy or the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we use for um, GIST, um, we tried to minimize um, uh, hospital um, visits with uh, blood tests being performed with uh, at the same time as the scans. And um, we also uh, tried to um, set up a system to deliver um, medicines uh, to patients rather than them having to come to the hospital to um, pick those medicines up. And in terms of our assessments, we would um, use phone calls to assess uh, for side effects. Um, if the side effects were really um, um, bad, then of course we'd arrange a face-to-face um, -face appointment. And in terms of patients uh, undergoing intravenous um, chemotherapy, there were 238 in March 2020. Um, uh, for our patient group, most patients carried on with treatment. Um, and um, in terms of inpatient chemotherapy, we only carried on with inpatient chemotherapy if patients were receiving neoadjuvant or adjuvant uh, treatment, i.e. pre- or post-operative curative uh, treatment. Next, next slide, please. In terms of clinical trials, uh, we did not activate any new clinical trials during the first lockdown. But for patients that were already on um, clinical trials, we carried on. And this is very important for uh, many of um, the GIST patients attending um, our clinic because we had a number of um, uh, clinical trials and compassion access programs open um, during this time, particularly for uh, repretinib, avapritinib, and carbazantinib. And in terms of the uh, scan or imaging schedule, um, we uh, made no change to uh, the scanning uh, schedule for patients on treatment. For patients on active surveillance, we tried to space out the scans as much as uh, possible to try and um, uh, minimize again um, hospital um, visits. And for our multidisciplinary team um, meetings, we of course um, converted all of those to uh, teleconferences. Next slide, please. So this is the um, study that Dr. Nixon uh, mentioned. Um, um, this uh, looked at the um, rapid transition of face-to-face um, -face appointments to telemedicine during the um, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and particularly um, with emphasis on the um, impact for rare cancers. And as was mentioned, telemedicine is, is, is the delivery of health services using communication technology rather than face-to-face -face visits. And we wanted to see basically what was the impact of this rapid enforcement of telemedicine uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic on patients 
on uh, clinicians and potentially also on the health system itself. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, patients were offered a telemedicine appointment prior to their scheduled outpatient appointment, um, but we still wanted to see people if they were very symptomatic um, um, or if their um, scan had shown that the cancer was worse. We uh, collected data uh, for patients treated or seen between the 23rd of March and the 24th of April 2020. We also looked at the average travel times and distance from patient address to the Royal Marsden using um, Google Maps. Next slide, please. So patients with a clinic appointment were invited to consent to participate in an anonymous patient experience survey. And we also asked the um, clinicians in the sarcoma unit um, with an uh, anonymous electronic survey um, as well to gauge their uh, satisfaction with this process. Next slide, please. So out of the, um, uh, the 379 um, uh, planned face-to-face -face appointments, 283 were converted to telemedicine appointments, so 75%, which is a huge proportion. Um, and patients lived on average one and a half hours from the Royal Marsden. Patient satisfaction in general uh, during this time period was high with uh, telemedicine um, out of the 108 that responded to the survey. So the mean was nine out of 10 in terms of the satisfaction with um, telemedicine appointments. And only 48% um, would not want to hear bad news uh, using um, telemedicine, which again challenged um, almost the sort of conventional um, dogma that we shouldn't um, uh, break bad news um, um, over the telephone. And very interesting that 80% of patients desired some telemedicine as part of their future care, um, citing reduced cost and travel time as important factors in, in this decision-making process. Next slide, please. So in terms of the um, clinicians that we um, surveyed, um, uh, many found that telemedicine was efficient with no associated increased workload during this time um, compared to face-to-face -face appointments. It was indicated the lack of, lack of physical examination did not often affect care provision when using telemedicine, but I suppose there are caveats that maybe we can discuss um, in the question and answer session about that. And that most um, of the clinicians um, believed that telemedicine uh, use was um, in fact practice changing, so 94%. Half of telemedicine appointments were performed by a cl clinician who had never met the patient before, and more than one third, uh, 39% um, desired nurse presence with um, a patient for all telemedicine appointments. And there was no difference in reported change in workload. Next slide, please. So our conclusions from this study were that telemedicine can revolutionize the delivery of cancer care. And this is particularly important for patients with rare cancers who often live far away from expert centers. Next slide, please. So um, Alana Smirk and uh, Eugenie Younger um, did a lot of work for um, two of these studies and Eugenie um, led on this study on health related quality of life experience of sarcoma patients during the pandemic. Um, basically because the pandemic had clearly had a ne negative impact on mental health and well-being in the general population. And we wanted to find out what this had um, done in terms of our um, patients and their um, quality of life and mental health. Um, and we looked at the impact of the pandemic in terms of care experiences, worry, as well as health-related quality of life. Next slide, please. So we did a cross-sectional survey uh, um, assessing the experiences of GIST and sarcoma patients, both at the Royal Marsden and at University College London. And um, patients over the age of 16 years with the diagnosis of either GIST, soft tissue sarcoma or SDS, or bone sarcomas were um, invited to participate. And we looked at um, planned outpatient appointments between the 23rd of March and the uh, 23rd of May uh, 2020 in both the medical and clinical oncology clinics. Next slide, please. 
So in total, um, 350 patients um, uh, were um, invited. The median age was 58 years, 55% were female, and 82% were Caucasian. And in terms of uh, care modifications, 74% um, uh, were converted to telemedicine appointments, 34% had a postponement of their appointment, um, as 34% had postponement of scans, and 10% had postponement of treatment. 72% felt the quality of care was not affected, um, uh, but importantly, 87% uh, felt that their social life was affected, and 41% felt that their emotional well-being had been affected as well. And um, 85 patients or 24% reported being lonely. Um, and 150 use, uh, patients or 33% um, um, had low uh, resilience. Next line, please. And this um, uh, shows the, uh, this uh, chart shows the, um, uh, the impact in terms of sarcoma and COVID-19 worry um, in the context of treatment in, uh, intent and active um, treatment uh, status. So worry was clearly um, um, a major concern, both in terms of the sarcoma treatment, but also in terms of the um, um, COVID-19 worry, uh, particularly um, uh, for um, patients undergoing curative and palliative therapy. Next, next slide, please. So satisfaction with telemedicine was, um, was good. Um, in terms of telephone appointments, the mean satisfaction score was 8.7 out of 10. In terms of video um, appointments, the mean score was 7.4 out of 10 in terms of satisfaction. And in comparison, the uh, satisfaction with face-to-face -face appointments was um, uh, 8.4 out of 10. And again, 74% of patients would uh, like some form of telemedicine in uh, their future care. Um, uh, and the factors influencing this are um, the uh, convenience, the time that it took to uh, travel to uh, their respective hospital, as well as the financial impact also. And again, importantly, 22% uh, of patients would like only face-to-face -face, um, appointments um, um, uh, as their follow-up. So clearly telemedicine isn't um, an approach that everybody um, likes and um, it's important for us now to give um, people the option in terms of what would be their um, preference. Next slide, please. And in terms of um, some final points regarding uh, Dr. Younger's study, um, 22% of patients in that study uh, did know, not know what the intent of treatment was, whether it was um, um, uh, curative or um, uh, palliative. Um, these people tended to have higher uh, worry also regarding COVID-19 and insomnia, and were more likely to want face-to-face -face appointments. And we think that um, basically um, telemedicine is here to stay beyond the pandemic. Um, there are, of course, longer term consequences of telemedicine or the postponement of care um, for um, patients um, during the pandemic um, period. And I think it's important that we highlight that um, uh, extra psychological support is probably um, needed, um, but we have to make the um, arguments with the um, uh, funding and administrative bodies to um, justify that. And we'll probably look at that in future studies. Next slide, please. So in, in essence, we need to try and carry on delivering the best possible care to our patients that we can, despite problems such as the um, pandemic. And this is not always as straightforward as it may sound. Um, and it's trying to balance the, um, uh, the, the, the toxicities of treatment versus the quality of life. Um, but we'll clearly learn a lot from this um, process over this last year, both in terms of the psychological and emotional impacts of this. Um, it's clearly um, um, put telemedicine at, at the forefront and many patients want to carry on with um, a hybrid model in terms of alternating uh, telemedicine appointments with face-to-face -face, um, appointments 
but it's crucial to know what each individual um, patient thinks and wants and we um, intend to, um, to to work with people to you know find the best fit for them basically next slide please thanks robin that, that was brilliant um we also did a study aiming to look at how telemedicine is viewed by patients and providers the study is a sister study to the study led by by robin at the marsden and is actually building on their work uh, and a head of publication at the JCO journal. So from the 8th of June to the 25th of August, we conducted an anonymous survey for patients and for Sarcoma MDT members across the whole of Scotland. We probed participants for views on how provision of care had changed. The questionnaire we used was based on the one used by Prof Jones and team at the Marsden However, with a few amendments and additions tailored to Scotland. Data were extracted. Uh, we used descriptive statistics and uh, the way telemedicine was defined was as any consultation that was not face to face, therefore either telephone or video consultation. Here you can see patient demographics. In total, we had 74 responses. We had even distribution between genders, majority of patients coming from Glasgow, and actually 22% of the responders um, are patients with uh, GIST diagnosis. So what did patients say on how they view telemedicine? The majority of patients would like mostly telemedicine and occasional face-to-face -face appointments going forward. The responses were not significantly affected by age or gender, comparatively small sample size. The reason for favoring telemedicine was largely related to time and cost pressures. Unsurprisingly, most would not like to receive bad news via telemedicine. However, Robin's study found that only 48% of patients wouldn't want to receive bad news in this way. Moving on to Sarcoma MDT members, we had 26 responses from our MDT members with representation of all regions and all disciplines. Care providers reported that with regards to workload, telemedicine is similar to face-to-face -face consultation or even uh, reducing workload. Better infrastructure would improve barriers. In addition, video-enabled telemedicine would improve experience. Majority reported telemedicine should become part of regular practice for follow-up appointments for patients on surveillance and follow-up appointments for patients on stable doses of anti-cancer oral treatments. Only three responders reported that telemedicine should not be implemented into practice and patients should always be seen face-to-face -face as before. What we found was experience of both patients and providers was broadly positive on telemedicine. Both patients and providers were receptive to the long-term implementation of telemedicine in the clinical encounter. However, providers indicated appropriate patient populations such as follow-up patients. Patients would rather have a face-to-face -face consultation to be given bad news. Clearly, there is more work to be done and telemedicine, although here to stay, is not one size fits all solution. What we propose is a qualitative study moving forward to look in more depth into patient and providers experience, aiming at gaining the understanding to shape future services tailored to the needs of sarcoma patients. Clinical nurse specialists play a greatly important role in cancer patient care. And at this point, I am inviting Alan Abraham, a sarcoma nurse specialist at the Beetson, to share his observations as key worker for our patients during the pandemic and lockdown. Hi, my name is Alan Abraham. I'm a sarcoma nurse specialist based at the Beetson Oncology Centre in Glasgow. And I work um, between the oncology teams based at the Beetson and the surgical teams based at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, being the sort of main point of contact for our patients, main key worker um, 
sort of coordinating patients' care between the various centres that are involved. Um, the main differences I've experienced in my role during the COVID pandemic are pretty wide ranging. Um, the most obvious difference has been the way we have moved to a more uh, remote way of working. Um, both with the patients and working as a team. Um, in terms of the patients, and the most obvious thing is the clinics and the way we have moved to a more telemedicine-centric uh, way of working. Um, we review most of our patients who are stable and have been on treatment for a few years or are many years down the line now. Um, we review most of them now by means of telephone call. Um, and Patients that are on treatment or having issues are obviously still being offered in patient, uh, sorry, in person um, appointments and reviews. So they've still been attending, but most of the time we've been trying to do things remotely. And I feel the feedback on this has mostly been positive. Um, patients understand the social distancing sort of guidance that's been enforced on for all of us. You know, the the. The whole country has had to follow these rules, not just the NHS, and most patients are understanding about that. You do still get the odd patient that is, obviously, the, the fear of recurrence is a very obvious thing um, for our patients to be worried about, and a, a very common thing, and certain patients will still like to come in attendance for a clinical review to make sure that um, they've been examined in person, and that's fine. Where the levels of anxiety are causing a problem for that patient, and we can, of course, arrange that. Uh, however, again, it, it's been it's worked pretty well. We've been able to arrange local surveillance X-rays and scans for people, give them the results over the phone, examine them over the phone. We've also worked um, closely with a website um, called My Clinical Outcomes uh, for our GIST patients, where some of our patients have registered themselves on this website. Uh, they complete some quality of life questionnaires um, at the end of every month. The website will generate a score for this patient based on their answers and it just gives us some extra data to help um, help us recognise any problems that are going on with patients if, they've, if there's a noticeable you know, downturn in their um, performance status then the My Clinical Outcomes website has been really useful to us for identifying some of those things, maybe even sometimes before the patients themselves notice that they're feeling um, a bit more run down than maybe they were uh, a few months prior. Um, it's also changed how we work uh, as a team, as I said, and that's probably most obvious by the way we do our MDT now. Um, it used to be the case we would all gather in person for the MDT and uh, conduct the meeting that way. However, now we're doing it as a, more of a virtual thing on uh, Microsoft Teams. And I think actually, certainly from my own point of view, I think this has resulted in an improved attendance at the MDT. More people are showing up just because it's more convenient to show up. They can do it remotely instead of having to be at a certain place at a certain time. Um, and they, I do feel there's been more, uh, been improved attendance. So I do think there's more expertise that now shows up at the meetings and it allows for a better quality of decision and outcome. And um, I do feel that's been beneficial. And I, I personally hope after the, you know, in the post-COVID world, post-pandemic world that we keep the MDT as it is because I do feel it's, it's probably better than it was just with the, um, the move to a virtual model. Uh, whilst attendance in person is down, also I feel this has resulted in an uptake in like, the phone calls from patients and their relatives, um, a lot more anxiety over certain things, um, I think mainly around the fact that relatives are not able to visit their family members in hospital when they're in for their surgical procedures or when they're in having their treatment. Uh, used to be the case also relatives could come in and you'd have access to the consultants, you'd have access to the ward nurses, you could ask your questions, whereas now you're hearing everything second hand from the patient over the phone. And I'm sure as patients yourselves, you've all been in the situation where you've been interrogated by a relative, um, just wanting to, you know, check what the doctor said, what did they say about the scan, what did they say about that drug, what did they say about the trial, um, and maybe they've wanted to call a nurse like myself to corroborate your story, make sure you're not getting anything mixed up. So that's that's been quite a common thing and certainly um, had an increase in activity for us from that point of view. Uh, also been an increase in activity, I would say over three specific points during the pandemic and I'm sure that's something that all we, uh, patients will recognise and that would be the first two lockdowns, especially the first one, um, and the rollout of the vaccine. 
obviously with the lockdowns, um, again, the first one, the shielding letters were going out. Obviously, it was this developing worldwide story. Um, a lot of anxiety from patients and their relatives wanting to keep each other safe. I've not received my shielding letter yet. Should I? You know, should my husband or wife be shielding? Can they go to work? Um, what does this mean if I've not received the letter? You know, there was a lot of anxiety about that uh, in March, and I think that those two or three weeks after that first lockdown were, without question, the busiest time I personally have had since I came into the role. Um, I saw the main kind of need there, I think, was reassurance and reassurance in the government guidelines and reassurance that they were being managed safely during COVID. Um, so that was quite a busy time then. And yeah, I've noticed that a similar uh, pattern uh, now recently when the, the vaccines have been getting rolled out. Um, again, a lot of questions and anxiety about uh, what group should you, you know, what priority should you be for being offered the vaccine? Should you take it? Which one should you take? Should your family be offered the vaccine also? Um, can I take it when I'm on treatment? You know, a lot of the same questions coming up again, understandable. Um, the, the patients and their families will be asking these questions. So that, I feel, has been the most noticeable um, cause of anxiety over the last year. I feel obviously the pandemic has caused havoc with a, a lot of people's mental health and I think going through a cancer diagnosis, going through treatment for cancer, um, without the support of maybe your family and friends who you would normally see to help uh, prop you up a bit when you're going through a hard time like that, I think has um, been quite cruel for a lot of our patients and I have found a lot of patients a bit more open to the suggestion of psychological support. Um, I do think it's with a lack of access to GPs has had a lot of uh, negative effects on our patients. Um, I think certainly for a few patients I can think of it's sort of stirred up a lot of uh, reminders of maybe a delayed diagnosis before they came to us um, and again that fear of recurrence and fear that something's going to get missed so I definitely feel these things have had a a negative effect on our patients as well. Um, just to end on a positive, I would say we're also conducting a, a patient experience um, sort of survey just now for our radiotherapy patients throughout COVID. We've had some, let's say, I'd say pretty much universal positive feedback on this. Um, main things taken from that are that patients haven't really felt that the COVID pandemic has influenced their treatment in any way in terms of their radiotherapy. And that's quite reassuring being part of the team that they know that we still look to tailor the care to them uh, as an individual and that the team, whilst maybe they don't see us as often, the team are still there and they're still able to investigate or act on any problems or concerns that they might have. So that was good feedback to have uh, from that survey and that's still ongoing. But so far we've had some good um, information from our patients about that. Um, I'd like to just finish, uh, seeing as I'm talking to patients, by just saying uh, thanks. Um, I'd like to say thank you for your patience during this pandemic. Um, obviously, it's been a very good, very difficult thing to work in, and I can't imagine what it's been like to be a patient during all of this. And whilst there's been a lot of anxiety and uh, frustration at times, I've never really found a patient I felt that was unhappy for a COVID-related reason. I think the level of understanding and patience they've shown has been remarkable. Um, various reasons, you know, why why family members can't attend the hospital to see them, why their local hospital is not available to them anymore for their scans that they would normally attend, um, why a trial might not be available or open to them. Um, patients have taken it all on their stride, and I've been so impressed by that. Um, because I don't know that I personally would have handled it as well as, as most of our patients have. So, again, uh, a real uh, heartfelt thank you to you all and uh, thank you for listening and best wishes. Thank you. So, in terms of the um, vaccination um, programme, um, it's important to emphasise that um, vaccination is recommended to all patients um, receiving anti-cancer treatment. Um, and of course, there's uh, um, a clear need for um, caution. Um, there have been severe, um, uh, particularly if there have um, in the past been severe allergic reactions to drugs such as paclitaxel or um, calyx. And um, in, in that context, um, it's important not to use the Pfizer vaccine as it contains 
polyethylene glycol or PEG. Um, um, but um, the modified um, adenovirus Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine may be more appropriate um, in that setting. And this recommendation um, regarding um, vaccination uh, to all um, patients undergoing active cancer treatment, of course, also applies to patients um, within clinical trials. Um, we don't recommend that uh, vaccination is on, um, that it's not on the same day as cytotoxic chemotherapy, um, but it can be on the same day uh, for patients receiving tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which is important, um, as, as mentioned in, in GIST, um, as well as patients receiving monoclonal antibodies or immunotherapy. And vaccination is probably not a good thing to do if, um, if somebody's undergoing treatment for infection or other treatment-related toxicity. We usually aim for uh, vaccination for a few days prior to the next cycle of um, chemotherapy. So next slide, please. I mentioned this a little bit earlier on regarding clinical trials. So um, following the first lockdown, we uh, reopened our um, clinical trials at the um, Royal Marsden and um, um, proceeded with um, opening um, new clinical trials as well. And of course, this was very important for many of our patients, um, uh, particularly our GIST patients, um, trials of repretinib, avapretinib and uh, carbozantinib. But we've also got a number of compassionate access programs also for, um, for GIST patients. So we're very keen to um, get clinical trials and compassionate access back up and running um, following the first lo lockdown. So uh, next slide, please. And now moving on to a project uh, relevant to GIST patients and aiming to use information provided by patients using a special platform called My Clinical Outcomes. A bit more about the background is that digital patient reported outcomes uh, measurement can help services to monitor patients remotely prioritize which patients most need clinical review via phone or video and focus the consultation on their recent progress. So My Clinical Outcomes, or else MCO, is a platform allowing for this data to be collected and has already been used in other cancers and showed that it can help improve care, particularly during the pandemic, as many of the patients need to stay home and avoid face-to-face -face contact. In other words, MCO can remotely track PROMS, which is of great help for clinical teams to address patient needs promptly and actually tailor plan on the basis of the person's needs. The patients are invited to register voluntarily into the platform and are invited to fill in quality of life questionnaires in between the clinic appointments, which is on a monthly uh, basis. The idea is a member of the team looks at the responses regularly and the responses are also available to the clinician or nurse who sees them in clinic. The questionnaire used is the um, EORTC uh, quality uh, of life questionnaire. Therefore, it's not, uh, it's not tailored to uh, patients with GIST. However, according to patients who registered, they found this helpful from the clinical perspective, we actually were able to identify issues and be proactive about two of our patients in between appointments. The issues that were raised and flagged were non-relevant to case diagnosis and side effects. However, we managed to support and coordinate further care for them. We're still looking at our results. We're still collecting data. And once again, our numbers are, are small. We have 18 patients registered. MCO uh, is, is actually a platform that might be funded through NHS across Scotland for collection of PROMs. Summarizing all above, sarcoma and GIST patient needs have been more complex during the pandemic and lockdown due to a number of reasons, some related to the disease itself, the changes to the services, the guidance for self-isolation, restrictions on visitors in the hospital, also fear of COVID infection, lack of access to supportive services and more. Robin and I shared so far a few of the actions taken by the oncology community, as well as some of the work we did to better understand patient needs during the pandemic and lockdown. 
I would also like to share what our colleagues and patients have said about the challenges during the pandemic and lockdown, and also about anything they view as a positive change. Here is what they said. can leave you with three questions to perhaps think about and, and share your thoughts at the end of this um, talk. What did you find most challenging about this time? What helped you cope during this period? And what would you like to see more from the team looking after you and from the service? Closing in, in this slide, we see a snapshot of a Zoom meeting, very popular these days. What is special about this meeting is it is uniting patients, clinicians and the health minister in a virtual celebration on the completion of the first panel of the Cancer Tapestry. The Cancer Tapestry was born during the RISE event in 2018, the event I mentioned to you at the beginning of this presentation. In that event, Andrew Crammy, who is a former cancer patient and also an artist, shared the idea of creating a tapestry on cancer with other patients. The support was extraordinary, and this novel project started joining hundreds of patients, families and healthcare professionals telling their story with a stitch. Here you see Heather, a former cancer patient and lead stitcher for the first panel of the cancer tapestry, who is adding in this ceremony the final stitch. Heather on that day, which was during the first lockdown, spoke about her own cancer journey, the needs of cancer patients, and also expressed her support to all the patients undergoing treatment during the pandemic and lockdown. And her story reminded all of us that at the heart of all healthcare, are people with hopes, fears, and every one of them matters. Special thanks to all our colleagues, but mostly to all the patients and their families for their patience during this challenging time. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Iona and Robin. That was um, most interesting. Um, and I, I'm amazed personally about the effect that telemedicine has had. Um, maybe some good might come out of all this bad stuff that's going on with relation in relation to COVID-19. Uh, we were a bit longer than we expected there, but nonetheless, uh, the chat um box and the and the ability to ask questions is still there as shown on this slide um we have one hand up um and cherry proven if, if you'd like to ask your question if you unmute yourself um that would be good cherry are you there Okay, whilst um, Cherry maybe comes back to us, uh, Jane, do you have any questions from the chat group? Um, yes, I have a couple. Um, actually, um, the other person that had a question was Karen Lee. So um, Karen may not have put her hand up, but Karen, would you like to ask your question? 
Um, hello, sorry, I'm in a bit of a busy environment. I'll see, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm Eleanor Morgan's mum and she tests, she um, is a GIST patient from the age of eight and she's now 24. I had um, genetic testing and um, it was shown that I am the genetic carrier um, for Eleanor's gene. I had a full body scan MRI in November 2019, which showed no signs. And I just wanted to know for myself um, what my next steps should be. Who, who would like to say that? Robin, Iona? Yeah, um, thank you uh, for the uh, for the um, for the question. Um, it's um, it's always um, good in terms of um, follow up and um, um, management of a, um, a particular um, case to um, uh, you know discuss that with all the um, available. Um, information um you know so that the um correct uh recommendation um is 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 given um is there anything in relation to the um uh, you know to the pandemic that you're um uh, concerned about or um in terms of um of a lack of uh follow-up i suppose yes not having heard anything um via phone email for follow-up appointments Mm -hmm. And have you uh, have you um, contacted the um, uh, you know the the, the, the clinic in, in in question? Not yet. Yeah, maybe that's um, a, you know a, um, a good thing to um, to do because it has been a challenging um, time for all um, health services, um, uh, um, unfortunately. And um, um, we always appreciate if people um, follow up and. Um, you know, uh, just just remind us um, that, that um, um, you know they haven't received information regarding follow up because um, you know there have been um, problems in terms of um, um, computer systems as well as the um, mailing service. So I think maybe the first port of call um, is to um, you know follow up directly, maybe with a, a telephone call um, with uh, with the clinic in, in question. Of course, um, Dr. Nixon and I um, would be um, delighted to um, to help um, if 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 need be as well. But uh, it, it's I suppose one of the downsides with such a confusing um, time for all health systems that sometimes you know follow, follow up appointments um, may have fallen fallen through the cracks. I can probably add an extra section on this. Obviously, um, Aaron, um, in terms of example, the Paul's Gist Clinic, which obviously we would uh, be related to, um, we've, we've not been able to run any because obviously we haven't been able to host sessions where people can come to a clinic and meet face to face. But um, in that situation, Dr. Belusu has been seeing people in his, um, in his standard oncology clinic, and obviously he does do telemedicine as well. So um, if you, if you, have concerns. I mean, 2019, having had a scan, I'm assuming you're worried about uh, the fact that there's been quite a gap. And, and when should you have your next scan, for example, the usual. So if you if you were to make uh, an inquiry with Dr. Belusu, I'm sure he'd be able to advise on what's the best next step. OK, thank you very much. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Cherry, are you now unmuted? We'd like to ask your question. So. I think so. Yeah, you are. We can hear you now. Would you like to okay. ask a question? I live in the northeast of Scotland and I had, well, I've had breast cancer twice, but I also had a gist. But I feel very rowed away from everything up here because although Aberdeen is a sarcoma centre, it isn't a gist uh, specialist centre. I've never actually spoken to an oncologist. Uh, I, hopefully I'm clear but I still feel I've met a few other people up here as well. And we all kind of feel a little bit remote, stuck out here. We're nowhere near Glasgow. Well, it's about two and a half hours away, I suppose. Um, but I've just wondered, and we don't have any clinical nurse specialists up here who've been trained, at least they weren't when I was diagnosed. 
I was wondering if I could, I'm sorry, is it the owner? I can't pronounce the name. I'm sorry. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Nixon. Yeah. Okay. Has any progress been made in that, or has the pandemic made that very even more difficult for you to to be able to make patients who are stuck out as far as us? Um, I've been one of the sarcoma centres, but it isn't a GIST centre. Um, has there any progress been made? Because basically, you don't really have anybody to talk to. And I have to say, had it not been for the GIST uh, support network, I think I probably would have cracked up. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for sharing that. And, and clearly, the role of a CNS as a key worker is so important for, for every single patient. I know that up in the north, and actually for the whole of Scotland, um, the distance is, is, is big. People do travel, though, and if you would like to come and see us in Glasgow, we would be more than happy to facilitate that so that you feel that you have discussed your case with, with a centre that has got three people that treat guests. Um, with regards to CNS input, of course, it is an unmet need, and we are addressing that through the Scottish Sarcoma Network. Every centre struggles, sadly, and it falls down to resources again and, and funding, And but we, are, we continue to push for more support. And as I said, feel free to contact me uh, or contact us in Glasgow, and we will be very happy to discuss your case. The other thing to provide you reassurance with is that every guest patient is being discussed at the National Sarcoma MDT. So people refer the cases to the National Sarcoma MDT. I know that, but the thing is, it left us at sea. I'm, I'm aware of that, but basically, I did speak to the surgeon about my very small margin, clear margin, but he just said it was a margin. I, I would have liked to have discussed mm. a few things. It's too late now, it's two years ago, and hopefully I'm okay. But um, I do feel for the other people who are newly diagnosed, if they, I had had cancer twice before and probably could cope more easily maybe because of it. But I think it's very difficult for someone who lives up here. As you can tell, I actually started I don't come from here. I actually started life down in the Royal Marsden, so I do know the difference. No, I okay. Hear. You make an Thank excellent you. point. I think, um, I, I think you know, as, as, as was mentioned, telemedicine is not for um, everybody. Um, but this um, pandemic, one of the positive uh, things to come out of it is that um, we, it'll be much easier uh, for us with our um, hospital administrators now to arrange uh, telephone or video uh, consultations with um, people that live in, in remote areas. So hopefully things will be um, will be better um, for um, people in the north of um, Scotland and elsewhere that does take um, a long time to, um, to, to travel to reference centres. And that was the reason that we wanted to look at the average distance people had to travel um, to the Royal Marsden um, for our um, COVID uh, studies, because that clearly impacts um, um, patient preference in terms of face-to-face -face or telemedicine follow-up. Okay, thank you very much for that. We've got a, a couple more questions here. Uh, Roger C. Kings, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me? We can, yes. Yeah, very well. Uh, yes, my question is actually about the... Uh, uh, the COVID vaccine. Um, I noted Robin Jones saying that the Pfizer was um, not recommended and I've already had one dose of it and I'm due another one on Saturday. So is this um, a, no, a complete no-no or just uh, in, inadvisable? No, uh, so that's a, a, a no in terms of the, um, uh, if there's a previous history of a reaction um, to um, a specific um, uh, chemotherapy drug. So um, uh, the, 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 that vaccine is, um, is, is good and um, should be, um, uh, if, if, if you're due to receive that, I, I would carry on and, and take it unless you've had a, um, a reaction to um, um, specific um, chemotherapy drugs such as paclitaxel or, or, 
or calyx. So that it's important to be um, clear about that. That's a very sort of um, niche um, 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 context. Okay, okay. That, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions, and we we must move on. So, uh, Fern Watson, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, and then we will have Anne Longfield after that. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm very curious as to what, if there is a network for Northern Ireland. I currently live in Bangor, Northern Ireland. I was diagnosed this time last year. And obviously due to COVID uh, and COVID restrictions, again, I have probably had two face-to-face -face consultations only because I requested them. Uh, and I would like to see if there's a network of people here. You're meaning talking to patients? Talking to patients uh, in Northern Ireland who have uh, been diagnosed with, uh, with GIST. Because unfortunately, the oncologist, Anne McMillan, cannot give me that information. There seems to be no network at all. Yeah. And uh, we do have quite a lot of um, virus GIST patients who are actually connected with our um, private email uh, forum for patients. Um, I, I, obviously, are, are you connected with our forum? Because um, as I say, if, if you are, then if, if you ask the question about speaking to other Irish GIST patients on that forum, those that are registered will make themselves known to you. But you're, you're welcome to join it if you'd like, if you aren't currently on that forum. Okay, this is Patrick and Fern's husband. Uh, the NHS did not direct us to this GIST cancer. We got directed to Macmillan for general cancer. And there, and it was only a friend in Canada referred us to this. Goodness. So, okay, and can this be done without being on Facebook? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. The fact that you've registered for this meeting, I'm assuming uh, we will have, have your details. So if, if you'd like us to connect with you and uh, tell you about how, how you can uh, connect with other patients, then be very happy to do that. Yes, like that'd be lovely. Thank you. That would be much appreciated. Sometimes it does feel very isolating uh, yeah. having the, the type of cancer that we have. And uh, it's yeah, we completely understand. We're, we are, in fact, looking into, or we were before COVID, into having a, a patient meeting face to face over in. Uh, Ireland, but um, that's had to go on the back burner for now. But we will be looking into that in the in the near future, hopefully. So, uh, right, one last question from Anne Longfield. Then, can I ask all the people asking questions to unraise their hands, if possible, please? Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I live in Surrey. I'm actually undergoing um, investigations at the moment with a. I've got a tumor in my stomach, which is a suspected gist. Um, I, I saw I saw the consultant at the end of March who said I needed um, various tests within two weeks. I'm now waiting till the beginning of May for an um, endoscopic ultrasound, uh, which is slightly longer than I'd have anticipated. Um, my question really is, would I be able to request a transfer to the Marsden? Um, yes, um, for sure. We'd be delighted to, um, to help. And um, if your um if the doctor wants to um write a a letter um 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 we, we we'd be absolutely delighted to um to to help fabulous thanks very much indeed robin that's great thank no you problem. pleasure thank you. thank you okay right we're um we're only running uh, nearly 45 minutes over time. Um, That's my fault, but... Nick. I talk too much. Jane knows <laughs> once I get started, I, I don't stop. No, I, I, it's important. I've, I've checked with the production team. They're quite happy for, for this as long as um, uh, Vicky and, and Wendy are, and I'm sure they are. So um, we're, what we're going to do now very quickly is if everybody who wants to be on a photo um, can turn their videos on, and then the production team will take a quick photo. So everybody smile for 30 seconds or so, or so and uh, hopefully we can, get, uh, we can get a photo. I've only got four photos up there. Are we gonna get more than that? 
Hi, it's Anna here from the production team. I can see lots of smiling people. If you go into grid view, you'll be able to see everybody back. So I'm just thinking about what it is now. Bear with me. Oh, so I can, yes. One moment, everyone. Oh, yeah. <coughs> um, right. I still want to know why I couldn't get into the city. I can't ask that again. Yeah. Smile. Okay, I think I've got everyone there. Thank you very much. We'll go back to the slides now. Okay, excellent. Right, a little bit belated, but um, give, given uh, Vicky and Wendy plenty of time to warm up. Um, so I will now hand over to uh, Vicky and Wendy to talk to us about continuing to work when diagnosed with GIST. Over to you guys. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Vicky Rockingham. Uh, this is... Ooh. One second. Anna, my uh, clicker isn't working. Can you forward the slides, please? Thank you. So um, this is a picture of me um, when I got my MBE that I received for a uh, contribution to the environment and for charities. Um, I was nominated by my organisation for some of the work that I've done within our organisation that I work for, the Environment Agency, where I also set up a cancer network and for some of the work that I've done in raising funds for GIST Cancer UK as well. Uh, next slide, please, Anna. So this is a picture of me about, um, I think it's about six months to a year before I was diagnosed with a GIST that was removed during an emergency operation on the 24th of December, 2007, whilst visiting friends in Dorset. I was 35 years old, married to Adam, and we had two sons aged four and 22 months at the time. Um, I worked part-time for the Environment Agency. I was back in work within six weeks after my partial gastrectomy, mainly because I wanted to be. Um, for me, returning to work was part of my journey back to normality or my changed life, as I would say. Uh, my sons are now aged 17 and 15. Next slide, please. And if you press next slide as well, please, Anna. So the Environment Agency is part of the DEFRA group and we follow the same equality, diversity and inclusion strategy. The strategy aims for all employees to bring their whole selves to work. They want people to be themselves, so they perform their best. The Environment Agency has also set itself a really tough well-being ambition that working for the organisation will help improve people's health and well-being. I completely relate to this, as I find work gives me purpose, it distracts me from my side effects, plus it helps fund my boys who are ever more expensive, and our household, and as well as that I feel like I'm contributing to society. Um, my eldest son is about to start university hopefully in September in London of all places, so um, that's going to cost us a little bit of money. Um, Anna, could you go to the next slide please? So here, this is the changing story of cancer. In 1970, as these statistics show, the average um, survival rate was one year. And by um, 10 year, in by sorry, 2015, it had increased the survival rate on average to 10 years. So this shows how significantly survival rates have changed. It's estimated that 2.5 million people were living with cancer by 2015. And the predictions are that this will continue to rise. With the combination of an aging and growing population and more effective cancer treatments, this means the number of people living with cancer continues to rise. As we know, many of us, in the year 2000, there were very few options for treating GIST where that GIST either couldn't be removed or had spread. But now there are at least four to five effective treatments available to GIST patients. And for myself, I've been on regorafenib for over six years now. As we all know, each person's experience is different and living with cancer diagnosis is life changing. Next slide, please. So what about work and cancer? Well, in 2015, it was estimated that there were more than 890,000 people who were living with cancer and who were of working age. 
and this is going to continue to increase. Estimates suggest that 87 of people of those who were working when diagnosed with cancer wish to remain in work. Work can help regain a sense of normality, it can help with your mental health, and it can improve your health, your self esteem. And of course, as I've alluded to earlier, there's always the financial aspect too. It means there are now people remaining in or returning to the workplace who have additional support needs. There's a clear business case for supporting people affected by cancer who return to the workplace. Employers can benefit from keeping people in work for a number of reasons. It can help st staff morale throughout the organisations by showing that they're a caring um, organisation. It often um, will result in loyalty to the company and it can avoid additional training and recruitment costs. There are also more people caring for someone with cancer and, cancer and juggling full or part-time work. In 2015, it was estimated there were 700,000 carers of people with cancer in the UK that were working full or part-time. So carers are very much often a hidden group. Carers are the ones who have to juggle work and their caring responsibilities, and they can find that very tough, but there's lots that employers can do to help things. Next slide, please. So what about the legal rights? Well, cancer is classed as a disability under the Equality Act and the Disability Discrimination Act in Northern Ireland from the moment of diagnosis. It also applies even where there is no longer any evidence of cancer. Therefore, it applies from diagnosis for the lifetime of the employee. Some statistics suggest that more than one in three managers don't know about the Equality Act 2010 that it covers people with cancer. Other statistics show that one in five people who inform their employer of their cancer diagnosis said that their employer did not discuss any options with them, such as reasonable adjustments, sick pay entitlement, or even have a communication plan in place. Next slide, please. Carers' rights, what are their rights? Well, disability discrimination legislation provides additional protection for people who experience discrimination or harassment because they are associated with someone with a disability. So, for example, it would be unlawful if the partner or son or daughter of someone who has cancer was refused a promotion because of concerns that they would be unable to give sufficient attention to the job because they were a carer. By law, any employee in the UK who has worked for an employer for at least 26 weeks has the right to ask for flexible working. This means working a different pattern to the way they are currently working. You can apply for a permanent or temporary change to your terms and conditions. By law, you don't have an automatic right to flexible working. It is just your right to ask for it. But employers do have a duty to deal with requests in a reasonable manner. An employer can refuse a request of flexible working. They have to give a good reason for doing so. And you can, of course, appeal that decision. Employers don't need to make reasonable adjustments for those who are not disabled, including carers. However, carers have the right to reasonable amounts of unpaid time off to look after dependents in an emergency. And this is covered by the Employment's Rights Act 1996, as amended by the Employment Relations Act 1999. It can be very stressful juggling caring responsibilities and work. Some people consider giving up work completely to care for a partner or a family member, or even take re early retirement. Carers should take really careful advice on this before making a decision, as it can impact on their future employment and pension and other things. It's also important to remember, you don't have to live with someone to be a carer. So for example, an elderly parent living in their home, own house. For many people, working is a necessity, it's not an option. It is often financially necessary for carers to remain in work and also give them a sense of normality and a life outside of caring. 
The benefits to employers of supporting working carers include increasing staff morale and loyalty, and again, staff retention. Next slide, please. So what are reasonable adjustments? What does this mean? There is no fixed definition of reasonable. What is reasonable will depend on a range of circumstances. But line managers should discuss with employees what support they feel they may need and review what adjustments might be possible. So possible adjustments can include allowing time off for medical appointments, adjusting performance targets, being flexible about working hours, allowing for extra breaks for people to cope with fatigue and adjusting sickness absence triggers. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about some of the reasonable adjustments that I have. The Environment Agency has introduced a number of policies to help support its staff and be an inclusive employer because it values its people. Some examples of adjustments I have used are listed here. So for medical appointments, I can take time off and I don't have to make that time back. The, rea the reality is, um, and this was obviously prior to COVID when I was going into the hospital each time, I would often take my work phone with me, keep an eye on emails or even read some work related documents whilst I was waiting for my appointment. But that was very much my choice. As environment agency employees, we're all um, in, entitled to flexi time. So I'm contracted to work 37 hours a week and we have a four week flexi period within which I can work longer hours and shorter hours. There are caps on the minimum and maximum hours I can work. So I use this to work shorter days when I'm struggling with fatigue and then make the time back when I'm feeling better. I can also take longer lunches or even break up the day with a series of breaks throughout the day to kind of work my way through or around certain meetings or certain responsibilities that I may have to do in a particular day. Prior to COVID, I was allowed to work one day a week from home, again, to manage some of my fatigue, etc. And since COVID, I've been working full time from home and I'm finding this has massively helped with managing fatigue and my work life balance. I really didn't, I don't think, I fully appreciate how much traveling was taking it out of me each day. I also feel that I'm more productive being at home, less um, disturbances, managing my time a little better. I'm also an area based controller for Greater Manchester Merseyside and Cheshire. So this is an incident role for floods, fires um, and other environmental incidents. I currently job share this role because of my health condition. And um, this is in addition to my day job. It's a 24 seven role and we're on call for 24 um, seven nine every nine weeks. I currently for for a week. I currently only do half a week because I find I can manage that. I think a full week would probably be a little bit too much for me. I also have an employee passport. There's a picture of this shown on the slide. This is a document that I use to um, put details about my condition. It includes information such as those agreed reasonable adjustments I have, the medication I'm on and emergency contacts. So obviously this was more vital when I was in an office if I were to collapse, for example, they would know um, that I was on the drug regorafenib and they would know who to contact. It's a voluntary document agreed with the line manager, but it's really helpful when your line manager changes because you then don't have to reiterate your story time and time again. And it's clear what has already been agreed. They, we also use these documents for carers as well. Um, other adjustments that I know colleagues within the organisation who have been affected by cancer have um, included being taken off their incident role for a set period of time, working at a different location, for example, a carer whose um, partner was going through uh, chemo for leukaemia and had to isolate within a hospital. Um, that individual was allowed to work from a different office that was located closer to that hospital for a set period of time being assigned different duties for a specific period. So for example, a lot of our st field staff that are operating machinery, um, if any of them are on cancer treatment, for example, it may not be appropriate for them to continue to operate machinery. So they would be assigned different duties during that period. 
And then there's also medical redeployees. So that's where it's deemed that somebody can no longer do their job because of the treatment or side effects. And therefore they um, look for additional jobs within the organization that may be more suitable to their needs. Next slide, please. So we have a number of employee networks to support our staff and many of these are award winning. Many of us use logos in our emails, including externally, and this has led to people um, directly applying to our organization, particularly where they felt discriminated elsewhere. What is unique about the networks is they're staff led. We set them up, we provide direction, and we have a senior leader that works with us and is our champion for that particular network. Next slide, please. So I helped launch launch our cancer network in 2017 and led it until 2020. The purpose of the network is to be an advocate there to speak up for others and help shape our HR policies and practices. We're also a signposting service so we point people to the wealth of information and resources already there and direct them to organizations such as Macmillan Cancer Support um, we've also direct people to GIST Cancer Support and also to Rare Can, which you may have come across too. We're there to listen to individuals who may be requiring support for specific um, instances, and that can include line managers too that will come to us for some advice. And then we also provide support by providing case studies and a buddy system. So particularly um, line managers will buddy up with other line managers to understand how they've dealt with particular circumstances. Next slide, please. So pictured here is um, Sir, Sir James Bevan, who's our chief executive. He's been extremely supportive of our network. Um, this is him providing his pledge for World Cancer Day on the 4th of February, which is around supporting our employees affected by cancer. So this support from the top of our organization has really allowed me and others to be really open about our cancer diagnosis at work and carry on with our careers. And for me, that's included a number of successful promotions too. Next slide, please. So one of my final messages to you is, um, about a cancer diagnosis really shouldn't prevent you remaining if, in work if that is something that you want to do. Talk to your line manager and work with them to come up with solutions to help you as basically you are the expert on you. It may take time to work out exactly what works for you and you will need to continually re regularly review it and adapt as circumstances arise. Sometimes the journey back after a diagnosis can be complicated and long. And I would also add to this when you change your medication too, and there can be peaks and troughs. So although this image here is about the journey back to work following treatment, actually, I think this can apply to a drug cycle too. And this image I actually sent to our chief exec um, after he was off ill a couple of years ago following an operation. Um, and I said, you know, just, just look at this image before you come back to work. Um, and he uses it time and time again now because he, he could really understand it when he was returning to work. It really hit home with him. Next slide, please. Um, if you have any questions for anything related to cancer, then I would really recommend Macmillan Cancer Support and their website for any questions you may have about work and cancer. Their support line, which is listed here, can help. And that's open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week. If you go to their website and scroll down from the home page to um, find the section information and support, um, and you click on that, it's got so much information on there. And it even has specific guidance for line managers. Um, uh, my line manager has actually contacted Macmillan, uh, not over myself, but another colleague um, in the past to ask specific questions and just check in that she was doing everything she needed to do. And she found it really helpful. Next slide, please. Um, so today we're very lucky because we're joined by Wendy Unsworth from Macmillan Information and Support Manager um, at Liverpool University Hospital. And she's here alongside myself to answer any questions you may have. So I'd like to hand back to everyone to ask any questions. Wendy, did you want to introduce yourself quickly whilst we um, were? 
Well, I am what you said I am. My name is Wendy <laughs> Unsworth. I'm, I'm not a benefits advisor. I'm a nurse by background. Um, I've been in nursing since ooh, the 1980s, so I'm an old-fashioned nurse with lots of experience of looking after people with all sorts of cancers, all sorts of cancer treatments. And um, I've been in this role now just for two years, uh, working with uh, information support. So if I can't answer the questions that you specifically put to me today, I'm happy to take them away, find out the answers and get back to you. Um, but yeah, the floor's yours, really. OK, thank you very much um, for, for that very informative talk. You, you Vicky, you've got a, a very understanding employer, but I'm sure mm. they have become more understanding uh, because of you. So um, well done on that. Uh, now, we have a question hand up for I.D. van der Plu. So if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. There you go. OK. Far away, we can, we, you're unmuted. Albeit we can't hear you. Uh, right, whilst we're sorting that technical bit out, Jane, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, it was in the chat, it was noticeable that a couple of people were saying you're, you're very lucky, Vicky, to um, have such an understanding employer. And I think what, what Nick has just said, obviously, you've probably assisted in that process. Um, Wendy, with, with the um, people that you engage with on a general basis, uh, we see that some of the perhaps smaller employers um, would struggle to, to necessarily... Um, adapt as quickly as a big organisation uh, because obviously each employee is uh, a major resource for them so to have to, to change the work pattern when you've only got a few staff is probably a more difficult process. Do you, do you get many inquiries from patients who are in that situation? We do and like you say every, every situation is different and I think what we really need to everybody needs to keep in mind when they're asking for adjustments is that it's reasonable adjustments so the person that's in charge of that organization or work whatever whatever they do um what we're asking for re whatever's reasonable but that they have to keep in mind that they're actually an operating business at the same time so what the you as an individual might see as reasonable might actually not work for them so i think having that conversation with them an open conversation about you know how it's going to work and if you can come up you know if you want reasonable adjustments making and you can come up with solutions that might work that they might not have thought of that might be something that they take on board um i know in the in the chat before somebody said you know having a you know join a union the union's quite good and yes the unions can be quite helpful in this situation but as Vicky said um, Macmillan information um, and support line um, that the the national helpline also can help with um, you know talking through the situation for each individual uh, person and coming up with, and helping you come up with a plan really. I think what was quite interesting is uh, also that Vicky said that the line manager had also rung Macmillan to get um, assistance with how to manage the situation. So um, I suppose from a patient perspective, um, that might be a good way to approach things uh, with this diagnosis, obviously to explain, you know, I want to continue to work and I probably mm. will have some adjustment, adjustments to help with that, but can, can we work at it together? Because Macmillan can help us navigate the best route and hopefully we'll, we'll each get what we need out of this um, relationship and this situation. Um, I know that all sounds like, um, you know, perhaps the best case scenario and not all employers are as um, understanding or as reasonable, but um, it's worth a try, I suppose, <laughs> to get somebody to help help the process. 
I think some something that we've sometimes seen is is employees. I, I appreciate I do work for a big organisation, so it is it is easier as an organisation to sometimes make these changes and adjustments. But one of the things we do see is is sometimes people are expecting their line managers to come up with the answers, and really um, they don't know how you're feeling or what you will or won't be capable of or what you're struggling with. So I I, I completely agree. I think it is about. Um, you as an individual trying to think about what will help you and what will work for you and working with your line manager to cut and the organization to convince them that you're a valuable person that they don't want to yeah. lose and and working together you know with them and Macmillan where you're struggling maybe and looking at all the different solutions and and trying things you know let trying to persuade them to let you give it a go and then see where we go from there I mean I noticed that there was one comment in the chat about an, a lady who had to retire from the NHS and I must say I, I've, I know of a few people that have worked within the NHS and for various different health reasons um, have had issues and it, it it does seem a shame that as a big organization that is there to care for others sometimes it forgets to care about its own employees um, that's just from my perspective I've seen that through friends no, I work for the NHS and we, we see an awful lot of people that come through that uh, with any cancer diagnosis and, and I have to say it's the same situation. Um, I know somebody's just put up in the chat as well about occupational health is, is, is a good way and they give good advice about work and adaptations. But again, if you're a big organisation, you may find that they have um, occupational health departments but some smaller firms actually don't have any occupational health either so um, I think then you know GPs and uh, uh, are sometimes helpful in that situation. I, I haven't got any other questions at the moment. No, I can't okay see. I got yeah there's no hands up and I don't think it's anything on the chat um, I've got just one just come in have, do you have any advice for Bear with me. Do you have any advice for addressing this with new stroke prospective employers? Employers, so people wanting to employ people. Well, I mean, Macmillan, you know, the information.org um, website has an awful lot of information on there about cancer and people working in the in any workplace. So you can, you know, if you if you want to. Uh, engage with Macmillan. Macmillan are quite happy to um, educate people. I suppose the question might be, um, for example, I, I, I have first-hand experience of this. Um, when I was first a carer for my daughter, mm -hmm. I was at the point when I was between jobs and I did think I'm going to go and get myself another job. But I, as soon as um, they wanted to delve into more information about um, what I'd been doing in the gap, <laughs> and I explained to them it was because my daughter had been diagnosed with cancer. I could see they're out there; they just switched off completely, and um, you know I wasn't going to get that job because they instantly thought, "Well, she's just going to have too much on her plate." I mean, they were right. I ended up becoming self-employed, but um, uh, that, that's uh, probably where I think the last question was coming from. If you're if you're applying for a job. How do you actually, what is the best way, I suppose, to actually broach the subject of your diagnosis? When should that come into the conversation and, and how can you manage that? So uh, what information like that on your um, um, website? <laughs> Well, I'm thinking, were you about to say something, Vicky? Well, I was just going to say, I, I am aware that um, we did a big recruitment campaign and there was a young lady who was just being diagnosed with breast cancer and... Um, she I don't know at what stage so I don't know whether she'd received the letter to offer her job or that was known just before they prior that they offered her the job but I know she was she was offered the job I mean it wasn't just her there were a number of people and she was it was clear that she was going to have to have some time off before she started um to undergo breast cancer treatment unfortunately she did pass away she I mean she was extremely young she was in her early 20s and they actually wrote a personal letter to her parents to say how sorry they were that she hadn't been able to join our organization. But, you know, they had offered her the job because, um, you know, along with other people, she had met the bar and done extremely well. And they were convinced she would have been a brilliant employee. 
Um, and I just think with the way cancer treatment is going and more and more people living with cancer, I think more and more organizations are going to have to wake up and say, well, actually, you know, people living with cancer are still a valuable work resource um, and finding the best way to continue to use their, those people and value them as employees. And I do think being open and honest about, you know, right from the start sometimes, you know, is, is a good is the way to go is a good thing you know as part when you're recruited into the NHS um you actually have to go for an occupational health review so you have to you know you ha have uh, to declare your past medical history um any current investigations and treatment that you may be going into um and that happens with quite a lot of organizations um and I think you know it, it would be discriminatory you know, so I think, you know, with the Disabilities Act and Equality Act, then, you know, each company, when they're looking to recruit people, have to be open and honest um, about their recruitment processes and, and be clear about the decisions that they're making and why, you know, if you weren't successful, you didn't get the job and you need to be asking those questions. If, if you weren't successful, you should be going back and asking, was this, you know, was this taken into account? Was, you know, why did I not get the job? And you're quite within your rights to do that. We, we've just had a post say I'm self-employed. I guess that's a a nod to what the differences are. Mm. So, okay. Um, thank you again. Uh, that was that was excellent. Is uh, uh, Dr. Nixon and Professor Jones still with us? they've gone I know they're busy people it sounds like they've gone so okay um I would like to have thanked them before they left but uh I guess we're um we're quite busy I'm here I can't see myself oh. thank, thank you it oh, was right. great okay. um uh, yeah it was great listening to everybody sharing we always learn when we listen to you so thank you for sharing and thank you for listening to our talk it was great to participate thank you for the thank you for the invite Okay, you're, you're welcome. Rob, Robin's online too as well. So, okay, I just didn't want to, you to both to leave before I had a chance to, to thank you both. Um, right, we're now going to hand over to uh, to Jane, who will just give us a quick update um, on where Just Cancer UK are at the moment. So over to you, Jane. Thank you. Can I see the next slide, please? So, um, in terms of the impact on the, of the pandemic on Just Cancer UK, um, this is our first meeting since, our first patient meeting for a year. I mean, obviously we usually do three a year. So um, we, we held off and held off for quite a while thinking we really want to go for face to face and we were hoping that lockdown would end and things would um, ease up, but they didn't. So um, this is really our very first attempt to address that um, part of the service that we commit to deliver every, every year, which is um, to enable GIST patients to get together and to learn more that might be of benefit to them. Um, all of our face-to-face -face meetings were cancelled, all of our calls GIST clinics were cancelled. Um, some of the GIST research projects that we fund have been delayed because uh, the clinicians and the researchers have been deployed elsewhere in relation to COVID. And uh, as a result, they had to put the stuff they were doing on hold. And obviously, um, as uh, with many charitable organizations, um, our income has um, suffered quite badly because some of the events that um, we've kind of come to rely upon to generate income, such as Ride London, et cetera, they were all canceled. Um, one thing that actually increased were the numbers of just patients that registered with us and um, obviously um, there's quite a few new people who are on this call today who um, are new to engaging with us and with other GIST patients. Um, so we're hoping that um, this is the start of obviously other online meetings that we're going to have and we really do hope that by the end of the year we can get back to doing some face to face but a bit like the telemedicine discussions um, you know, potentially we'll we'll have a mixture, a, a balance, because um, you know we can actually put these meetings on. Um, more people can attend, 
and um, you know you don't have to travel that far so hopefully it will be useful to everyone. Um, in terms of um, what I'm going to say next I need to see the next slide please. <laughs> so we continue to um, help and support patients um, we have a patient helpline should um, you know you have any things you want to talk firsthand to another GIST patient about. Our helpline is manned by people who are GIST patients. So they've been there, seen it and got the t-shirt, et cetera. Um, we have our online patient forum. It's a, a private forum, but if you want to join it to have that um, kind of thing in the background that says, okay, if ever I've got a question, doesn't matter what time of day, I can post it and there'll be somebody else on that platform that will have experienced what I'm experiencing or what I've got questions about, and they'll have some useful information for me. A lot, a lot of people find that very helpful. Um, obviously, we've got all sorts of different social media platforms. Uh, we have a website and there's quite a lot of useful content on there. We try to keep it up to date. And we've, we've also, over the past year, um, developed some patient videos, um, just patients talking on particular experiences like um, living without a stomach and uh, dealing with the um, emotional side of, a, of their GIST diagnosis, um, ideally to try and bring to life um, some of the patient stories that we've already got on our website because we weren't able to have meetings. We've still been participating in NICE and Scottish Medicine Consortium appraisals for new drugs. Um, so those things are still happening very much so. And you know, we, we recently were really pleased that um, the Roche drug uh, entrectinib was um, approved by the Scottish Medicines Consortium. Um, and there are other things that are in the pipeline with both um, organisations. We're still collecting just tissue samples for the National Just Tissue Bank. Um, you know, if, if patients are having operations and they decide they'd like to donate tissue, then um, we can help to organise that. And we're still funding um, the clinical trial, which is this three versus five years of matinib study. Um, we're still trying to grow cell lines from any pools, gist tissue samples we can obtain. And um, we're still funding research um, into RNA methylation and SDH deficient gist. So um, where we're sitting at the moment is we're anticipating that we're gonna get more applications for gist research. So we have to make sure that even though we've taken a dip in our um, fundraising, we've, we've got to find ways to alter that situation because we want to be able to fund more things that are gonna move things forward for GIST patients. Next slide, please. So um, other things we've done in the background, um, I think Vicky mentioned it, we, we've formed a partnership with an organization called RareCan and, and the, the stimulus for this is really um, that we are very keen to try and um, find a way as soon as possible to get even more attention about the needs of GIST patients. I mean, there, there are all sorts of different types of GIST and obviously not, not all of the drugs suit everybody that are available at the moment. And there are some types of GIST, which if the surgery um, isn't effective, then um, you know, the, the treatments that exist aren't um, effective either. Um, and what we're trying to do is to get together with RareCan um, to sign GIST patients up to RareCan. And um, they're hoping to, well, they are exploring collaborative projects with academic and scientific groups about developing new treatments. If, if, we, if we can't be seen, if we're all over the place and we're not sort of in a group saying, we need your, we need your assistance, it's gonna be difficult for researchers to find us. So, Rare can is hopefully a, a vehicle whereby we can do that. Um, we finalised our name change. Obviously, when we started as a charity, we would just support UK. We are now just Cancer UK. That, that required a huge amount of um, effort as far as back office type of work was concerned. Um, we upgraded all of our systems so that uh, we're now operating on modern platforms such as Microsoft Office, etc. And that, that makes life easier for us as trustees to communicate with each other. You know, we're all based remotely around the UK, but um, we have like a central office effectively remotely or virtually. And um, we're working really hard to replace lost income. We lost three of our trustees, um, unfortunately two of whom went to heaven. And um, 
as you could probably tell from all this, we could also do with some support right now. Next slide, please. So um, on that note, we, we recently um, entered a competition with some university students at Bath University and they created this um, video for us. So just thought you might like to see it and give you a rest from listening to me for a while. So um, if we can watch the video, that'll be great, please. Thank you for your interest in helping us. And by you taking the time to watch this video, we are already one step closer to our goal. This is Sarah. For years, she had been having headaches, colds, and stomach aches, but no medication seemed to help. It took four years for her to be diagnosed with chest cancer. Like many other chest cancer patients, she felt lost and unsure of who to go to for help. This is where Chest Cancer UK comes in. Since chest is such a rare cancer, most doctors and nurses know very little about it. This can delay accurate diagnosis and appropriate treatment. We aim not only to educate professionals, but also to raise awareness of GIST amongst the general public. We also promote and protect the physical and mental health of GIST patients in the UK by providing information, support, education, and practical advice to them and their family. We raise funds to stimulate GIST research and provide financial assistance to selected researchers seeking to improve treatments and find a cure for GIST. A couple of UK GIST specific research projects that we have stimulated are the National GIST Tissue Bank, and the Pause GIST Clinic at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. Both form the bedrock for GIST research, and the clinic is only the second of its type in the world. With your help, we will be able to continue these important research projects, whilst also encouraging and funding more GIST research. Hopefully by now, you're wondering how you can help. Donating need not be difficult, and any funds you raise will go a long way to support research and patients. Even if it's resharing this video to friends or family, it helps us to raise awareness of GIST. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates. There are many different ways to donate. Let's first talk about donating as an individual. When you're selling items on eBay, you can choose to donate a portion of the sale price to Just Cancer UK. This amount will also be free of seller's fees. By using easy fundraising every time you shop, you'll raise a free donation for Just Cancer UK or Pause Just. It's that easy. You can also make a text donation by simply texting these numbers. Try it now. You can also donate by sending a cheque to our treasurer. The cheque can be made payable to Just Cancer UK. Alternatively, if you would like the donation to go in particular to the Pause Gist area of our work, GC UK Pause Gist. Please also tell us if you want us to treat your donation as gift aid. We also have a special 1,000 Hours for Gist project, where we are encouraging 1,000 busy people to sign up and donate just one hour or equivalent of their wages each month. Setting up a standing order with your bank to donate to Just Cancer UK or Pause Just. Please quote either GC UK 1000 hours or Pause Just 1000 hours as a reference. Over the last few years, our amazing supporters have organised and taken part in hugely successful events, ranging from sponsored cycle rides, marathons to swimathons, all on our behalf. If you have an idea for a fundraising event, we'd love to hear from you. You may even be able to double or even triple the impact of the funds you raise with match donations from your employer. Please talk to your human resources department or employer's charity representative to find out if your company can match your donations to Just Cancer UK. And now let's see how businesses can help. Does your company have a payroll giving scheme? Employees can donate directly from their gross salary before tax is deducted through payroll giving schemes. You can sign up with organisations such as Charities Trust or Charitable Giving and select Just Cancer UK as your charity of choice. Initiatives such as Pennies from Heaven and Pennies, a digital charity box, allow pay slips and bills to be rounded up with the balance being donated. If you would like to partner with Just Cancer UK on schemes such as these, please email fundraising at justcancer.org.uk. Please visit our website and do get in touch. Thank you for taking the time to watch the video and please help us today to find the cure for tomorrow. Thank you. So um, there are also other ways that um, you can potentially offer practical support. Obviously, as I said earlier, we've lost some of our trustees and we're always seeking new volunteers. So if, if you have skills um, and you think you might have some time that you could volunteer, we're always interested. Uh, the types of things I suppose we're, we're hoping to um, boost our team with our administration and secretarial skills, um, obviously fundraising, you know, if you've got a legal background, um, accounting, bookkeeping, patient support. Um, for that, ideally, you'd need to be already a patient. 
Um, and uh, so we, we could also um, obviously uh, maybe add a carer to our helpline team. That would probably be quite helpful. Um, event management, um, if you've got experience previously of being a trustee for an organization, you know, those skills could also be beneficial. Um, so if, if that um, strikes a chord of uh, interest from you, please write to us at admin at giscancer.org.uk. Um, alternatively, if you've got some fit friends or family members, um, we've actually been fortunate enough to be allocated 10 places in the London Virtual Marathon, which is going to be happening this year. Um, so if anyone thinks they've got somebody who's capable of running a marathon and they'd like to, it's a long way, um, then by all means get them to contact our fundraising at giscancer.org.uk address. Um, next slide, please. Um, so to close, um, we hope you found, I did say the last couple of hours, it's slightly more than that probably. We hope you found this um, meeting useful and interesting. And um, we plan to have more virtual meetings. So if there are any topics uh, that you think you would find it helpful for us to cover, then please let us know. Um, thank you very much to our speakers today. I know Nick's already thanked you, but we are really grateful for your time because we know how busy you all are. And um, I'm wishing you all a safe journey from your computer to the kitchen to make a cup of tea now. So thank you. Next slide, please. Um, as I say, if you've got your phone handy and you'd like to text a donation, then the numbers are on the bottom of this uh, slide here. <laughs> It's very easy. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, well, that is the end of our very first virtual meeting. I'd like to thank all our speakers, uh, Dr. Nixon, Dr. Jones, um, Vicky uh, and uh, Wendy. Um, I'd like also to thank Jane for all of her hard work in putting this together and also to the production company that have managed to technically get this sorted for us um so uh, production bureau anna and, and all your team thank you very much we will be having another one of these we don't know when uh, but i'm sure we will let you all know as soon as we know where we're going to have it uh, unless lockdown stops uh, you know and and, and the, the vaccination program works so well that we are allowed to do it face to face um, in which case we'll we will be doing it face to face but i would anticipate that our next face to face meeting will be in in march next year in probably in bath which again we'll let you know via the the uh, the website but thank you all for attending i hope you found it uh, as useful as i did and uh, we will continue to work on your behalf in uh, in the field of just cancer to try and find a cure um, and further treatments and progress with research. So thank you again. And uh, that's us signing off. With also a thank you to Sharon Bethel for all her hard work. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Sharon. Did I forget you? I knew I'd forget somebody. I'll tell you what, let's thank all the trustees because everybody's had a bit of input as well. But yes, yeah, Sharon, thank you as well.